Stocks that exhibit relative strength tend to outperform the markets when the market goes back into an uptrend after a correction. So there's an element of established system, but also exploration that improves the system over time. There's a difference between studying something and then implementing it into your actual system. You always want to be thinking about uh, not just the overall results, but also subsets of results that can really give you an edge. And the more you simplify your analysis to, to be closer to price and volume, the better clarity you will have in terms of the conclusions that you make. Whatever setup it is, there's going to be a set of different characteristics, both technical and fundamental, that specifically relate to that one. And if you want to be, you know, those successful traders that we mentioned at the very start of this webinar, then you need to do the exercise. Welcome everybody to now webinar eight of the Ultimate Trading Guide series. Uh, this has been a lot of fun. We've covered some very important topics that hopefully have accelerated your learning curve. And today's topic is a really exciting one. Uh, it's a little bit more focused on future growth and developing as a trader. Uh, we'll be talking about trading studies and building model books. Uh, how to find and develop new edges. Uh, so this will be a really fun one and we'll kind of explain the key frameworks that we use to uh, both do a training study, uh, come up with actionable you know, conclusions, as well as build model books, um, which are basically compilations of uh, you know, key charts, key stocks, uh, analyzing their price moves, as well as the fundamental aspects that drove them. So uh, this will be a lot of fun. Make sure you guys stick around to the end. We've got a few uh, bonuses as well to throw your way uh, that you don't want to miss. Uh, so with that, Rai, I'll hand it over to you. Awesome. So framework eight, trading studies and model books. If you haven't downloaded, which I'm pretty sure all of you, all of you have, uh, the link is going to be in the description. Richard's going to send it over now. 115 pages, 16,000 words, seven frameworks soon to be updated to 10. Uh, and uh, we will likely send the updated copy, I guess, uh, as we update it in the coming months and weeks. Uh, and that link is going to be in the description of this video. If you're watching on YouTube or if you're on Zoom right now, it's in the Zoom chat. Mod, you know, model books, building model books, um, doing studies. What I see, that is, you know, and the, and the way I see it is your continuous development uh, comes from the work that you do um, while you're at the desk and, and putting in the hours. And what that bleeds into is you, when, when you get very, uh, you know, when you're self-motivated, that's what it tells me. And a lot of you know successful traders are self-motivated at the end of the day. And they did studies on their own um, and spent a lot of hours. So someone like William O'Neill, when they didn't have this digital technology, they would get charts printed, ordered, whatever the case was back then. And that was their motivation at the end of the day to really be, uh, and, you know, great and excel at this craft. Right. Uh, and that's, that's what, when, when you're doing studies, that's what it really means at the end of the day. Uh, as well is it has to come from within you have to be self-motivated and the third is you have to be really um, curious about how the market works or um, we all in some way shape or form try to figure out what the market and how it works and even though we will never reach that end point right because at the end of the day you know different people are coming into the markets different ways of thinking the psychology though ag on an aggregate basis remains the same the fluctuations that we see and when, when we say the word adapt, all of that comes from doing, you know, homework at the end of the day. So homework, doing studies, uh, whatever you want to call it uh, at the end of the day, this quote from uh, William O'Neill uh, sums it up really well. 90% of the people in the stock market, professionals or amateurs alike, simply haven't done enough homework. And this is from a man that studied 85 to 100 years of market history back when you know, um, and he came up with base patterns. He came up with uh, things that we use today, uh, even though we we might say, I see a lot of, you know, negativity around it. Hey, this doesn't work. That doesn't work. And I'm, I'm always of the belief that everything works if you have studied it on your own. And that's the topic of, you know, our discussion today is if you study it on your own, every indicator, every chart pattern, every base pattern, everything that you you could you possibly think doesn't work has worked for someone. That's why it's been giving you know different names and um, people have written books about their journeys in the market. So um, super important. I mean, all the seven frameworks kind of bleed into this one. 
Uh, if you don't do this, uh, then you can, you know, go out and maybe follow someone uh, and mimic what they're doing. But at the end of the day, if you go out and do a study on your own, it will build uh, kind of, you know, your knowledge and your expertise. And what I'd like to use the word, like you'll become the subject matter expert of whatever it is you want to be really great at. And this professional life, I know a lot of you are nine to five, you know, full-time uh, jobs. And then on the side, you want to really make this your new job, right? At the end of the day. So, uh, but it takes that, it takes that commitment, it takes that curiosity. It takes, you know, doing the dirty work yourself to get it done. Um, Richard, any thoughts on, you know, when you read this quote, what you see and what you think of? Yeah, I kind of think about, you know, all, all the different traders who have gotten a chance to interview U.S. investing champions, hedge fund managers, you know, what, what separates them from a trader who's just starting out or maybe a few years into it, or what even separates them from themselves when they were just starting out this journey. And for me, all these top traders that I've got a chance to talk to, number one thing is is passion. They, they love this. They, this is so intriguing for them. They're figuring out the markets. They're figuring out themselves as well. And that passion translates to wanting to find new edges, wanting to develop a system for themselves and putting in the work to study the greatest performing stocks and, and to find ways uh, to trade and find the, those stocks in the future that matches, you know, their situation, uh, their trading style, risk tolerance, all of that. So, you know, homework, you know, people talk a lot about doing the work. You got to do the work, got to do the work. What we're going to be talking about today studies as well as building model books are two of you know, I think the most important things when we say do the work um, if you do build model books as well as do a few trading studies finding your your top setups you'll build intuition and subject matter expertise just like Rye said that will set you apart and if you want to perform it, it's kind of non-negotiable you kind of have to do this for yourself build confidence all of that so uh, I think O'Neill, you know, he he studied a lot of the greatest performing stocks as well as greatest performing traders. And that work, you know, built on his own experience and just took him to the next level. So if you want to outperform, I think uh, this is these are great things to do, uh, as we'll cover in today. Awesome. So the the agenda today, we have eight steps we'll break down on how you should, you know, how you can potentially go about doing a study in the market. And then we'll get into how to build model books. And, uh, you know, Ross is, does this exercise every year where we release a, a trader line model book, which we will this year as well. Uh, and that's his way of studying kind of the market, what it did, what worked, what didn't. So how to do study finding and creating a setup. So at the end of the day, it has to be, like, like we spoke about last week, it has to be an efficient process But because a lot of traders I see will um, start a study but never finish it or don't have an efficient process of accomplishing uh, what they set out to do. So the, the topic of conversation today is basically how do we um, break it down into different steps so that we go just, you know, go step by step over a span. Maybe you do a study in about, you know, a small one could be about eight to 10 weeks um based on any you know could be a moving average crossover right and then you could take that and and do a study on that and and build a hypo you know conclusion based on whatever hypothesis that you have uh but it has to be an organized effort um and the goal at the end of the day is even if uh it's not about it, it works 100 percent of the time it's not about it works 90 percent of the time a lot of traders tend to uh, get a little bit lost on finding that holy grail. Like there, there has to be something that works all the time, right? We, we, there's no such thing that uh, that accomplishes that. It's something that gives you an edge over the market consistently over a series of trades, like we've spoken about. And if that is true based on your study, you have an edge. And then based on an edge, you define your setups and entry tactic criteria, like we've spoke, spoken about in previous. Uh, webinars. So I like what Richard said here, you know, you have an idea, hey, I want to study um, RSI above 70. And how do stocks behave on, you know, when that happens? Is it over, some people could say it's overbought, some people could say it's oversold. 
You can go out and say, okay, give me stocks over the last six months that have exhibited this. Uh, where was the market cycle in conjunction to this? And how did those stocks act? And then that's your idea. You make a hypothesis. You say, you know, uh, based on the study, I want to find out these things. One, is it an overbought setup? Is it an oversold setup? How do I enter this? And what's the probabilities of me being successful, right? You set out, you know, these are my objectives in a way. And then you get into examples. So you go out and collect examples. You could use screeners. There's many, many, many out there, right? Um, and, and collect and document, basically, analyze, draw your conclusions, and then iterate. The, uh, the thing with studies is as, you know, they can be definitive in, in terms of time span, right? They're simple studies like um, uh, something like a moving average crossover. It has a definitive uh, framework that you could use, whereas something like IPOs, that's something that you need to do yearly because there are new stocks coming into the market. The, maybe the IPO market was, you know, in 1980s is not the same as 2023 or the 2020s, for example, and things change uh, from that front. So that's why Ross does like a yearly model book, gives him a good idea of how leadership stocks continue to trade uh, year over year. So this kind of framework, you know, this this the model book type of thing, you know, it could be related to IPOs is more test and iterate, whereas a moving average crossover could be a finite, you know, study that you go through this exercise and now you're, the, you know, you're the expert of this. And every time you see it, you're naturally or you build that intuition, like Richard said, and you act upon it. And that could, you know, that's a definitive amount of time. So anything else, Richard, here? No, um, I think what you mentioned about um keeping and we'll get into this but you know defining the scope so you don't in the middle of your study try to do so much that you never finish the study i think that's a common thing that i see people doing they, they study this one and then they want to expand it to this set you want to be very specific especially with your with your first few studies to actually get a few under your belt refine your own process um because you can always tweak the framework to better suit yourself um and then I, I had one more thing, uh, but I, I think we addressed it on the next page here. Um, yeah, and, the, and ideas, yeah. we could discuss ideas a little bit. It could be uh, based on, hey, this person's using this, right? It could be that type of idea, or I always see this in the market when I'm scanning, when I'm doing my routines like we spoke about daily and weekly. I always see this setup eventually, or, or this type of action in the market lead to something positive. And that as you do your daily and weekly routines, it tends to stick at, in the, at the top of your mind. And that could turn into an idea that you then go out and study as well. So something like a simple one for, you know, the, the folks here could be um, stocks that exhibit relative strength. Like we say this, stocks that exhibit relative strength tend to outperform the markets when the market goes back into an uptrend after a correction. You could simply take the last five market cycles, however you define them, find stocks within each of those cycles that exhibited were winners and see if they exhibited relative strength. Just doing that exercise alone will maybe take you two to three weeks, but that exercise as you do it by yourself, well, you'll be so much more confident because you've, you've seen that, you've heard that idea, people have communicated that to you, um, it's something you take for granted right now, but when it's when it's actually time to act, the people that have studied it, right, for themselves and gone through this loop that we're talking about, act on it a lot better, whereas the people that just take word for it don't really believe it because they haven't done the work to actually, you know, build that intuition and that, you know, hey, I've seen this before, this is going to happen. Like CLS recently, uh, the stock is acting well, it's not pulling back. I've seen this rise in moving average, you know, ri rise in daily average volume. It's exhibiting relative strength. I've seen the story before, before they double and triple. So I'm like, I'm focused on that name uh, pretty much. So that's, you know, ideas could be external. Ideas could be from daily routine. Ideas could be, uh, you know, you you verifying basically what someone else has done at the end of yeah. the day. Let's dive so, in. Um. What's what is a trading study? Start with curiosity and observation. We just spoke about that. What's worked in the past, right? Um, don't build this negative mindset of hey, this doesn't work, that doesn't work. I, if you truly study the market and when someone has success over it, 
everything works. You just have to study it. Visualize the evidence of a fundamental technical or any pattern. So fundamental traders uh, will look at, you know, balance sheets, income sheets, and try to forecast the price action of a stock, right? Hey, uh, analysts are really good at this, right? Um, we are upgrading the price target of NVIDIA from this to that. And that's usually based on mostly fundamental metrics that they see in the potential of the company based on some visual evidence as you, even though most analysts, uh, you could argue, uh, you know, don't tend to get it right. But that again, it's visual evidence that they're taking fundamentally as an example. Technical evidence is like uh, this stocks in the WIC uh, are, you know, showcase strength and they, team, they tend to trigger to the top side. Uh, and when they do, there's a lot of momentum that's developed. Now that's a technical pattern that you could go and study, build visual evidence of that. Uh, and the third is build conviction. Conviction comes through documenting, finding examples, building your own confidence, and really seeing the numbers behind that. It could be a it could be an analytic type of you know way you go about it. Me and Richard are engineers, so we see everything in numbers, right? Uh, but not everybody sees it that way. But it could be as long as you document examples as much as you possibly can, it will build your confidence, conviction, and eventually you'll act on it more naturally. Uh, for me, the way it works is if I see it, I then break it down into numbers and then I break it down into probabilities. And then based on numbers, I just function on that. That gives That's the way I look at things in the market. Whereas you might be a little bit different. It doesn't always have to be numbers and statistics and Excel sheets, but some sort of documentation, some sort of repetitive loop based on, you know, um, you know, visualizing what you see as evidence and then keeping that somewhere stash could be a folder, right? Um, could be print out. I, I do print out charts because that it, I could see them in front of me and that works for me. But these are just some of the ways that you could go about it um, at the end of the day. So Richard, anything to add? No. On what is the trading study? No, I think I think we've covered it. So let's dive in here. Um, Perfect. So finding inspiration, we've spoken about this. So what, what makes these people successful? They all have the, you know, we what what do we know? The, all these people are successful at the end of the day. Uh, I don't think William O'Neill just woke up and uh, and said, can't slim out of nowhere, right? So he, he did the studies. He found the characteristics. He looked at and found the first cup and handle base. And it's the first chart in his book um, among the first hundred charts. And he said, this seems to be a pattern that seems to work on a weekly frame uh, or a daily frame. And it has a high success rate. So he collected all these examples, documented them, and he gave us a flavor of that with hundred charts in his book that he wrote, right? Stan Weinstein, same thing, his conversations that we had, um, in the, the conversations that we had with him, he said, hey, you know, he, he unprofitable, uh, subscribed to, to some website back in the day, or there were no websites. I'm not, he, he subscribed to some letter at the end of the day, didn't find success, tried to follow it, then noticed that stocks do this, came up with a framework, defined that framework, collected examples, right? Visualized the evidence. Basically, he's going through the steps of what? Typical stage one trader moving to stage three, defining a framework is basically what we're talking about today. And then he found success in the markets, right? So that's, we see this blueprint again, same thing with Minervini. He took bits and pieces of Billy Monio, Stan Weinstein's system, and then gave it his own flavor. He saw that uh, profit margins seem to be important. He saw that VCPs, there's contraction and volatility, and he coined that term and created a pattern or a setup, whatever you want to call it, that he sees it that way, where there's contraction and volatility increases uh, leads to range expansion at the end of the day. But all of that is through model books, studies, building a framework for himself, and then really studying that because he's the subject matter expert of VCPs. When we associate and say Brian Shannon's name, right? He, it, VWAP wasn't invented by him, but he took it, you know, mastered that skill, found a way to anchor the VWAPs and, and found consistency in that studied it, built a framework for him, and he's a profitable stage three trader. Same pattern that we see among all of these people. Oliver Kell, he takes inspiration from Weinstein's system, right? He wedge pops, uh, pull, you know, EMA pullbacks, you name it. You know, uh, He took different things that he learned from other traders 
and built his own cycle of price action. Now he sees success in the market. So how do they develop these systems? We see this consistent pattern of they notice something, right? Or they took inspiration from someone, but they went in there and did the dirty work for themselves. And if we want, you know, the over 200, 250 of us that are here right now, live, if we want to do the same, we have to make the same commitment at the end of the day. And if you can't make that commitment, it will never happen. Uh, or, you know, if that's, we got to have that goal, right? That elite goal of we, you know, we want to become sub subject matter expert. It could be something from these things. It could be something from your, your background. I, I have an engineering background. I think probability is the way I look at it. So I have my own playbook. Richard is developing, you know, uh, his own flavors as he, you know, he's interviewed so many people. So he takes bits and pieces of those, but he's come up with his own stuff as well. Um, so those things, this is how we find inspiration. Like we, we have a blueprint. It's a matter of committing to it and making sure it really works. So Richard, do you want to take this one? Yeah. So this is just kind of this saying the same thing in a different way. Uh, this is kind of how you should find inspiration for yourself. First step is kind of being being committed to improving, uh, treating a uh, trading as kind of an ongoing endeavor where you're approaching it as a student. You're always looking to to gain knowledge, you know, find out more, improve your system. Uh, and what what comes with that is you know, being naturally curious about the markets. I, I think, as I mentioned, you know, uh, passion is, is a key similarity of all these market wizards. And what comes with that is natural curiosity about the way things work how things work in the markets. Um, then you wanna kind of study established practices and, and see what tweaks you can add to them. Uh, you want to basically notice unique occurrences. We've talked a lot about expectation breakers, you know, key price and volume characteristics that stand out among uh, the winning performing stocks. And then you basically want to be willing to try new things and, and test things out. And it's always kind of a balance between your established system and new iterations. Um, I, I studied a bit of machine learning in 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 grad school, and there, in in reinforcement learning, you have an agent, which is kind of the actor, the trader, and in order to find the optimal path through a maze, they have an established system that they use. But then there's an element of uh, there there's a certain percentage of time that they try new things, and that learning that that exploration where they're not of they're not following their established system allows them to take that uh take those you know random spots where they try new things and see how that worked and if that worked better they add to their system so there's an element of established system but also exploration that improves the system over time and that that's what we're looking for awesome Yep. So let's get into it. That, that was a lot of ins inspiration stuff and and making sure you guys are sold on the the idea, right? Uh, if you're not sold yet, I don't know what to tell you uh, because we see, you know, there's a lot of success in having, uh, you know, doing this and making sure that these eight steps are followed. Okay, so before you get into it, right? I just, you know, the whole point of that inspiration, you know, it boils yeah. down to doing a study should be a lot of fun for you yeah. like i i love studying the market and you know uh looking back at the greatest stocks and seeing oh my god you know if i just held the 21 ema it would have been up 300 percent, and that's all i gotta do if you're not having fun while doing a study uh it, it it's, it's tough to be successful so you want to approach this as it's almost play you you get the chance to to study a setup an indicator whatever it is and you should be excited about finding out results and proving your system, all of that. So, you know, all that inspiration stuff boils down to you want to be motivated, excited, uh, and uh, looking forward to doing the study and, and figuring out new things about the market. Um, and if you approach it with that mindset, uh, you can't help but succeed. If, 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 if this is played to you, uh, you're going to do tremendously well. And the reward is is very good. It's not that, you know, all of this effort is for no gain. At the end of the day, you see the gain and, you know, some of the examples that we put up in the previous slides of like Oliver Kell, Mark Quintervini um, types. And that those, you know, there's a lot of, um, as you, once you get that flavor of success in the market, these things kind of get addicting, right? But then the other part of it is that stage one traders, when you're not making 
uh, an income or stage two traders where you're making it and then giving it back is the motivations lost because you don't see a point in doing it. Whereas the ones that did see the point in doing it are stage three, right? So I think the key part is when, especially stage one and two, to take it as this is a part of your journey that you have to kind of commit to for you to get to stage three. That's why we call it a framework, right? The ultimate trading guide framework. And then second is not taking on too much. So start simple, try to make a simple observation, try to define the scope of that study. You know, a lot of traders say, hey, I want to do this and that. And now I want to collect 3000 charts. That's unrealistic. It's not realistic at the end of the day, right? Yeah. So, um, so, so define study- your... Yeah, yeah but we'll, we'll, get, stuff we'll very, get into that for sure. Yeah. Uh, so just taking a high level view of the eight steps. One, we've covered, covered, be curious. Two, make an observation, notice something about the market. Three, we'll, we'll get into that, define the scope, keep it simple. Four, collect examples. Five, analyze those examples, look for trends, commonalities, outliers as well. Uh, then you want to go ahead and draw conclusions from all those examples, define your setup, edge, whatever it is. Uh, seven test in reality and then eight is just iterate over it you can add to your study you can look to improve the setup all of that so let's dive into each one and, and we'll also apply it using an example study so first things first i don't think we have to spend too much time on it because we've already covered this but just be curious have that as kind of a state of mind um hmm, i've seen that before oh before every breakout this seems to happen uh study winners and again find a balance between established system and kind of the exploration. Don't say, hey, Mark Minervini only trades this, so that's all I can do. Um, think about how ways that you can improve it for yourself and, and your own system. And also there's the difference between studying something and then implementing it into your actual system. You wanna separate those as much as possible because then you get into this, uh, you kind of you know daze yourself into, is this something I've studied proven and I can, attempt to do this in re- reality of the market or is this um, something I'm studying as for me personally when I used to study stuff before I would go out and try it a little bit too early I haven't really gone through these eight steps and then it would confuse me basically on the fact that once I did study it gave me the gains and then the ones that I am studying and all of a sudden I felt I was too confident too early gave me the losses at the end of the day so make sure that those two things are kind of separated uh, here, because a lot of tra- you can combine those two in a bad way. Even though you're making progress, you'll feel a little bit uh, demotivated by it. So, defining the scope of the study. So, this one's really important. Um, as an example, let's say you want to study. Uh, I will pick on relative strength. As you know, let's say we're building a scope for relative strength, um, and that's a broad thing, right? The stocks that exhibit relative strength tend to do better when the markets go back from a corrective phase to a uptrend. Now, it's a big thing to say, and it's it's a bigger generalization to make. But now you want to define the scope as to, you know, what you're defining in terms of market cycle. What's your uptrend? What's your correction? What is that? What type of stocks are you looking at in terms of the scope? Is it your penny stocks all the way to your most high price like CMGs, right? Or uh, Expedia's, et cetera, or BRK, or is it you're sticking to one side of the market and you've made that, you you need to make some sort of, you know, line in the sand because you'll go crazy looking at 20 cent stocks that move from 20 to 25 and that's a huge percent gain and they will skew your study in a really bad way. So let, let's say we're doing relative strength, then you make a make make another, you know, high, um, got, you know, Based on what you see, you, you trade liquid stocks. Uh, what what do you define as your liquidity? You you take that in and you kind of narrow your scope of your study to a very specific type of state or very specific type of stock in the market. Um, too generalized, too broad will lead to no conclusions because then you can't specialize in that uh, particular area in the market. So um, second is define your hypothesis. So you're kind of saying this seems to happen and now I need to prove it to myself. Right. So you write that down. What am I trying to, what, what's the purpose of what I'm trying to study. Right. And my hypothesis is that this seems to happen. Now I need to go out. It's not a personal thing. Like you have to 
have a neutral state. Uh, Mike Webster had a word a couple of days ago for this um, intellectual honesty or, or something like that, where as you go through it, the idea is not to prove yourself to the market based on your scope or hypothesis, right? It's to, to go out and be see if the market proves it uh, and, and not take it personally. Like a study can start, you define your scope and lead to nothing. So you have to be ready for that as well. So I will collect many examples of an observation I've made, could be relative, let's just say relative strength throughout this webinar. And my hypothesis is that stocks that exhibit relative strength in corrective phases seem to move up when the market reverts back to an uptrend. So that's a way to define uh, your scope. Richard, maybe you want to add to, you know, maybe a recent study you've done or uh, something you've looked at, maybe RMD, I would say, uh, that you've come up with. Um, and, and maybe speak to that in terms of scope. Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely be doing a study on RMV, which is relative measured volatility for people who don't know. Uh, it basically looks at, you know, how tight is price action versus the, the recent period. And what I would do first is just uh, look at historical winners and what RMV was before they broke out of key points, something like that. And I'd start with uh, 100 to 250 examples. And we've actually got an example of kind of application of this on the next page uh, using gap ups. So uh, if we go there, uh, this is kind of an example of a hypothesis that you could set for yourself. I will collect 250 examples of earnings gap ups from 2010 to 23. So you can see how we clearly defined that scope. Um, and then my hypothesis is that stocks with very strong earnings gap ups outperform in the months after the gap. So you've got both your hypothesis as well as something that you can test. How did they out, did they did they or did they not outperform the months after the gap? That will that will be for your study to decide. And you might find that whatever your hypothesis is is wrong, and that's perfectly fine. Um, you might you know find that there's not really much correlation, and that's important knowledge as well. So uh, you should be kind of um, you should come up with your hypothesis, but then almost when you're doing the study, be as objective as possible. Almost think like somebody else has created this hypothesis and it's your job to test it, whether it's true or not. That's what um, Mike Webster talks about when, he's, when, when he mentions intellectual honesty. Uh, it does no good to fool yourself into, into saying, you know, this setup is the best ever if your study doesn't show that. Um, that doesn't help your performance in any way. So you want to find out the truth. That That's what this is uh, all for. And it's kind of applying the scientific method to um, to trading. And your results should be pretty much verifiable by a similar, pers similar person going through the same series of steps. They should kind of come to the same conclusions. That, that should be your goal at the end of the day. And also when I did the, the high volume stuff, um and classified them as HB1, HBE, HB whatever, right? Um, it started with like a simple, you know, there seems to be, there, there seem to be gap ups in the mar market that are better than other gap ups. And there seem to be, it, there's some that fade and those are the lower price ones, right? So that was an observation that I, that, you know, made. And then that's where it goes. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a bigger observation. But then you could you could go back and say, okay, it they seem to fail when this happens. They seem to work when this happens. And then you add these smaller, you know, um, details to your study, and it and find a way for uh, you know uh, to build a framework around that. So for me, it's like when when a stock gaps up on earnings, and the market cycle is very early in that trend. Those are the best and the strongest earnings gap ups that I see because market momentum is aligned with market cycle, market momentum, breath is increasing, and the stock is, is also saying there's some sort of surprise, whatever the case might be, and there's huge volume, obviously, with HV. When those things happen, these things seem to work, right? That's when there's the strongest and the highest probability. So even if, like, let's say my hypothesis is that the stock is, you know, very strong earning gap ups, I'll perform months after the gap and your results come out to be 5149, then you can go in and dig a level deeper, right? And say, okay, there seems to be, you know, 50, 50, 
this thing seems to work. And what what are the ones that are working? How are they working? You know, when are they working? That that would be the layer deeper to change that 5149 to a 60, 40, 70, 30 type of split, right? Where you're fail, you're you're you've narrowed it down uh, to an extent where it becomes an edge for you and a, and a big edge that you could uh, employ as well. Yeah. So, sorry, just to add to that. Um, for example, you know, even if the overall results are inclusive, as, as Rice said, uh, there can be a subset of those stocks that exhibit special characteristics that you find that those really, that subset, that is relevant for that subset. So, um, you know, once you've got the data, say you, you for earnings gap, one of the data points you measure is gap percentage, and we'll get into that in a bit. And you, at the end of the day, you've got all these data points, you've got the gap percentage, and then performance the next three months, and you plot those against each other um, in Excel or, or Google, you know, Google Sheets, whatever it is. And you find that if the gap percentage is over 20%, that's when those stocks really relevant. But if the gap is under 10%, and overall, it's, it's kind of inconclusive. Doing this study, without doing the study, you would never know that if it hits this magic number or it's an ATR move, that gap, uh, those stocks really outperform. So um, you always want to be thinking about uh, not just the overall results, but also subset of, subsets of results that uh, can really give you an edge as you're going through this. Perfect. So second, you know, step to it is collecting, you know, visual evidence. As we said, you could, I really like printing and putting things in like, and binders and stuff uh people like to do it digitally that works as well so you can do it so first step is manual so study top performing stocks is a really easy way uh there are different sources out there that can give you the top performing stocks or you know very basic screeners can do it as well um, a database i think this is a little bit overrated i mean people go and put a number i want to build a 10 15 year database start with like three months uh, and then work your way back uh, to, to a couple of quarters. Start with a market cycle, I would say almost, you yeah. know, um, I think I say later on in the, in the model book building section, starting with the 2020 to 2021 market cycle is good. Cause they're, they're so clear, you know, there's the correction, there's the uptrend, there's the topping phase, and then there's decline. Uh, that's a great, uh, sample of data to start with because, because the, the patterns you... are so obvious. As you get more year, years uh, under your belt, you'll naturally have more examples. You'll build more seat time. You'll you'll just get better over time. Like don't, it's very important to to say, hey, I want to build this, and then put a put a number on it of ten years, and it's gonna bear you down, and it's it's unrealistic. So, second is crowdsourcing. You can work with a team. I think in this type of exercise, it's doable uh to to work with a team uh, i tend to do, you know uh, much of what i tend to do is alone uh, i don't want to crowdsource but if you think you know people have similar level of thinking or in in terms of collecting examples you could crowdsource it we do do a lot of that on the uh private access side of things uh and on you know social media and stuff it's very easy to do that and uh, it it accelerates what you want to accomplish right but i think Again, at the end of the day, you could go out and download someone else's database, but make sure you go through each of the examples because this exercise alone of finding examples is a lot of critical thinking and brainstorming. And that critical thinking, brainstorming, brain, you know, builds intellect and like it, it builds knowledge of what you're trying to do. Um, that's, at the end. that's the way that you'll learn the most is collecting it's, your own examples. Yeah, it's so, it's so like... I, I do see a lot of folks, you know, uh, publishing database. I've done this and that, and uh, you go and download it. It's fine. They've they've done that, but you download it doesn't make you any better um, until uh, Elon figures out neural networks and chips in our brains. <laughs> uh, third is automated. So use Python. I, I think it's a great way. Um, obviously, some people have backgrounds in programming. Some people don't. Um, it's Python, you know, I, I know a few folks on the private access side that built scripts, hooked them up to uh, Yahoo Finance's library and did exports of, you know, generalized criteria. But now you go through each example of that 
and uh, kind of figure out. So it's a good way to, to go about it. Uh, or you could use screening platforms uh, as well. I think, you know, over time, let's say you do a study for six to eight months and you say, I want to make this observation in the market. And every time I see this, I'm going to save, snip, clip, whatever you want, that chart and save it into a folder. That's also, you know, one of the manual ways. And I think, you know, the best way, uh, like uh, we've stated here uh, to do it, because again, it builds that, it wires your brain to see it as well. So um, many different ways to do it. Um, pick whatever works best. What's most important is if you want to do crowdsource or automated, you still have to do the dirty work for it to stick in your brain. When you go to sleep, the brain do does its magic and you wake up and you get better and better from it every day. So data to collect. So let's say we now have examples, 250 examples of earnings gap ups. Uh, and our hypothesis is that earning gap ups over a span of multiple months seem to outperform other stocks in the market, right? We've collected those 250 examples uh, in, in some way, shape or form. But before we do that, it's basically what 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 do we want to look at uh, in terms of uh, we find those examples, right? It's very easy to find those examples, in my opinion, if you generalize your scope enough. Uh, but after that, it's the nitty gritty that we spoke about. So market environment, you want to break it down because, again, three out of four stocks follow the movement of the market. 37% of the stocks move as industry. Um, and, you know, you want to have those stats in mind. It, you can even, I guess, go and study those stats. That could be part of your study, but let's just take those as frameworks that are proven. Uh, and we define our uptrend, downtrend, or choppy could be one example. Uh, data points could be technical or fundamental with respect to gap ups. What comes to mind is uh, fundamentally earnings growth, sales growth, the surprise factor. What yeah, is this? The next slide, because we've, we've got some a list here. Okay. Data to collect. Um, market type. So yeah, the Qs are above the rising 21 EMA or below a rising 21 EMA. So this we talked about in the market cycle webinar, right? Technically, you could say how big is the gap, the number of gaps. Uh, this is, you know, uh, different observations. You get percent from high, low, ATR move. What's the closing range on that gap up uh, volume compared to 50 SMA above or below? So these are things that as you go through your trading, uh, you tend to look at as well. Uh, and you will pick up along the way as the, these factors seem to be a little bit more important than other factors, right? Um, and keep it simple. I get a lot of people like, you get complicated with the Kelter channels uh, on this and it close above that. All At the end of the day, like those channels and all of that stuff boils down to price and volume. And the more you simplify your analysis to, to be closer to price and volume, the better clarity you will have in terms of the conclusions that you make. Uh, I think that seems to be lost where people get a little too fancy. You know, I drew this uh, cloud on there and this and that happened. So stay away from that because you want to start simple and someday you'll get there, but don't start with clouds and work your way back to price action. Third is fundamentally, right? The basics of, you could look at EPS sales growth, Profit margins, there's, you know, uh, 250, 275 data points that are reported in every earnings release. Uh, those could be factors that you pick up on, a book you studied, um, or someone you saw say something about this, right? Uh, PE run rate. Uh, it, there's so many, you know, uh, things that are written in books, and, and you pick up on those, and you can include them as is there a fundamental edge? Is there a technical edge? And what the market type is? I think the most important one here is market type because it defines a lot of what happens. When a 2020 happens, doesn't matter what your profit margin is, you're gonna get slapped in terms of stock price, right? And we know that, and we visually see that. Uh, when corrections get bad and fast, investors don't, are not looking at fundamentals as much. There's a lot of loss losses that people take by holding on. 86% drawdowns, 98% drawdowns in Roku, uh, Square, Square uh, Lemonade insurance, and all of these high flying stocks that we saw, right? Even though fundamentals might not change much. I think this one 
for me, I would say, you know, if I were to recommend one metric, make sure you align with some sort of market cycle system. Uh, Richard, anything else comes to mind? I mean, like technically, like I, I start looking at if the low of a gap up is above a number it's never been before, let's say 25 bucks or something. I think that's a huge deal, right? It's a big change for that stock. It's a big liquidity, new liquidity environment that comes in, new institutions that start looking at that stuff. Um, and that's something I I include. Um, yeah. Minervini and his examples have spoken about primary basis, and he defined yeah. the scope of those as well, technically. So, so I, I think the larger point here isn't related to just a, a gap up study, but you, you want to, so whatever setup you're studying, whatever pattern you're studying, what are the relevant characteristics to that study that you think about visually when you're looking at an example? For a VCP, it's how tight was that last contraction? How many contractions? What was the trend before that contraction? For a gap up, it's the volume, it's 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 the percent gap. Whatever setup it is, there's going to be a set of different characteristics, both technical and fundamental, fundamental that specifically relate to that one. And that's the data. Those are the data points that you want to keep track of for each example that you use in your study. And again, start small. You can always expand the study later. Uh, you know, finding the examples is kind of the hard part, you know, collecting these data points per example. Once you've already got the date and time that it happened, you can always go back and add more data if you want to study an additional characteristic that you think of later. But, you know, start with, um, you know, three or four key characteristics to start with, uh, and then you can always add from there. So I think that's the key point. Whatever setup you're studying, think of the set of characteristics that are important for the quality of that setup. Uh, what what does the ideal setup look like? What what characteristics describe that ideal setup? That's that's what you should think about uh, when you're coming up with this list of both technical and or fundamental uh, criteria. Because you know some setups, especially if you're a more technical trader, you don't need to you don't need to care about fundamentals. Uh, but you know some people like Warren Buffett, if he does studies, uh, it's almost all fundamental. So it, it kind of depends who you are. So I, I think that covers it. Uh, moving on to the next slide here, analyzing examples. So just like you have to come up with a set of criteria for determining the setup, de defining the setup, um, I call that definition criteria. You also want to think about performance criteria, which is once you come up with an example of the setup, how do you measure if it worked or not? What 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 kind of performance metrics are you going to consider to, to wait whether if that was a successful example of the setup or not. So again, for the gap up, we've got some examples, performance one month from the gap, uh, performance one one week from the gap, you know, it could be three months from the gap, uh, percent percentage drawdown from the gap up low in the two weeks after that. So again, you're thinking about all the potential scenarios from that setup. And how how would you measure in your mind a successful trade or unsuccessful trade if you entered that setup. And that, that should help you come up with a list of these performance criteria. And then you also want to think about uh, grouping different examples together. So for a gap up, there could be stocks that just take up, take off, and there's no give back at all, immediate movers. There can be ones that move up for a bit, then form a U-turn and then explode, or there can be ones that just gap up and completely fail. So as you're going through the set of examples, think about different ways that you can group them together that make sense, that classify them in similar ways that are helpful so that in the future, you're connecting what's happening in real time with a real example to one of these groups. And that gives you a blueprint in your mind about how they should act. If it's a U-turn, maybe, maybe you define that as it moves up for three straight days, then pulls back 50% of that move forms a tight range, and that's what you're looking for the U-turn. Uh, being able to group like this and, and visualize what the blueprint looks like, that's how you're connecting current states to past ones, and that's how you'll you'll build the edge in real time that you can use and perform. So, uh, Ryan, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this. You know, How do you think about um, defining the, the successfulness of an example and, and uh, determining performance criteria that you'll use in a study? Yeah, I think uh, in terms of 
one thing that comes to mind in terms of the success criteria that I tend to look at is not in terms of um, like the, how many times, you know, I, I tend to look at more probabilistic than performance so i i don't define as like hey is it up 25 percent? and does this setup result in a 25 percent gain on a stock it's more so do these aggregate setups bring out you know is there potential on an average basis for this to happen right that's how you kind of want to look at it um and, and there might be you know i these immediate movers something instantly that comes to mind is that I'll, the common thread among these immediate movers that I saw with respect to gap ups again was sector movement and industry movement was in line. Cybersecurity names were working, cybersecurity names gapping up, cyber cybersecurity names moving, right? Now you, you grouped them and then you can define that okay, immediate movers tend to be in successful industry groups or top ranking industry groups. U-turns get associated with, might be a lone warrior in that group, right? Uh, a ANF type of move recently, it's just zipped up, whereas other retail is not doing too well. Uh, there might be some of those, and but they're generally associated with they gap up, come build a base, you know, and then break out. So this, I think, is super important. Really good point to make. Uh, the IPO folks did the same thing with their uh, study as well. Uh, if you if you've seen the uh, IPO masterclass. They did, you know, groups, they, they bucketed IPOs into these different groups and then came up and named those patterns uh, as well. The only thing, you know, to, with respect to performance criteria, it don't expect the studies that you do historically to dictate your actions in real time. Like, Hey, you could say on average, they move up this much, but there's always going to be real time scenarios that will not result in that. So I see people say, hey, uh, this CELH type of setups move four or five hundred percent. I'm holding there no matter what. And then the U turn that whole thing based on that performance criteria they set. They could have an 80, 90, 110 percent gain, but they're so confident and then you the turn the whole thing and they make absolutely nothing out of it. Don't go that extreme real time analysis of that. This is giving you the probabilities of that happening. It's not saying that the probabilities of that happening are hundred percent. So there's make, make a clear distinction uh, in your thought process on those two things when you do this. So I guess analyzing uh, examples from a gap up, uh, here we have the stock. I'm assuming. Let me. You want me to guess the stock? This is APP. No. Nope. Wait. Every, everybody should know the stock. So this is just an example. Um, no way. This you should know the stock. You should know the stock. Anybody in the chat? Yeah, let us know what you think. Uh, I promise everybody looks at the stock almost every day. How is this not APP? I, I gotta say, it based above twenty, it based above twenty, gapped up into the twenty base. I don't know. APP comes to mind because it did that, but SMCI. Wow, interesting. Nope, not Nvidia. SMCI looks similar, but it was in the eighties, nineties, I think. There you go, Michael got it. Michael, nice, nice job, Solar Note. Yeah, it's Tesla. This is Tesla in twenty nineteen. Post split, I guess. Yep. Okay. Well, I think that that sucks. <laughs> I'll blame the splits. <laughs> All good. Um, so analyze, yeah. So you could take this and say, you know, some people take the close, some people uh, take the high. I think high is a good way because it gives you the lower performance criteria of looking at that name. Um, but this gives you, you know, just a this, you know, stock gapped up. You could have a volume criteria. We're talking about gap ups here, by the way. Like, so we're not trying to narrow down how how do you refine your performance criteria for gap ups. So this could be, they tend to move on at, you know, this could be one of the examples that you collected and now you document this, right? Yeah. And then over a span of what we said in our scope, we need 250 of these examples. Uh, doesn't necessarily mean that you need to find all of the ones that look like this. There could be gaps that are U-turns, failures, immediate movers. This one was an immediate mover, basically. Gapped up, uh, went, came back in, consolidated, and then trended above. 
this rising, I'm assuming 21 EMA. Yeah. So, and uh, so I'll, I'll first talk personally, uh, and then Rye, I'd love to hear your thoughts. You know, for a particular example, kind of what I do is a pretty simple chart markup almost of, of the relevant price and volume characteristics, looking at volume, looking at price action. Uh, you know, that's, again, we're applying it to gap ups here, but it's going to be relevant to the setup. So for a VCP study, I would make sure to keep track of, you know, how tight is that last contraction? I'd mark that up on the chart. And then I kind of save each of the screenshots on its own page in Google Docs and then do a quick write up underneath it, highlighting the key price and volume characteristics as well as fundamental characteristics if I'm keeping track of that. So that's how I treat kind of each individual example. But Ryan, I'm curious to, to hear about how, how you go about it. Uh, you know, you know, looking at one example, what, what goes through your head? What, what are you kind of measuring with each one? Yeah, so I tend to, what I tend to do is collect everything based on this first candle is what the objective is first and then and then get into which ones failed basket them which ones moved immediately basket them right maybe i give them different names but which ones uh you know uh failed right away you know failed but then recovered that could be a sub basket but again it's just a different way of looking at it and then uh bucketing them into different ones and then just you could start from this very simple observation. I think it's a good one. You just say, how much did it move, right? Or how much did it not move? And then take a table. Uh, if it's 250, it's very easy to find 250 examples. Uh, and write down, okay, this one moved 60% in X amount. This one declined 25% in this amount. Then within that, you you build a column, label it. Right. These are failures. These are successes. These are whatever you label them. And then uh, you there will be subcategories to these as well. Did the industry move? Did the market was the market the cause of failure? What time of um, it's one of you know, where in the market cycle did this happen? What were other stocks doing? Was, you know, uh, was this like a late stage gap up? Right. Uh, later on, way down in the cycle. Um, it, all, all those things kind of come into, you know, play. And then you could easily do this for 250 stocks. I would say like a week, week and a half. Uh, if you spend, you know, maybe a half hour to an hour a day. Uh, and then at the end of it, you'll have, okay, in this market cycle or the last three market cycles, this is what's happened. Here's the evidence, right? Um, and keep it simple, like keep it simple. Like uh, I wouldn't even stay away from like ADR, ATR, just say price moved up. Closing maybe closing range was this, market cycle was doing this, industry group was doing this. Start there, and then get fancy with you know this happened volatility increase and all of that stuff. Um, you know price volume first, then everything is a derivative of price volume, technically speaking, right? And then fundamentally it depends on what you look at. So I don't have much else to say here. But... Yeah, let's keep moving here. So analyze the data as a whole. And in groups, I think this is a really powerful concept in groups. For the IPO folks, if you haven't watched it, it's it's a great series to go back and watch. Um, they did a really good job of this. Uh, plot definition criteria versus performance. So look for trends, look for outliers, analyze outliers. So how do you uh, define success? So let's say we do a gap up study, we find the examples, we make a table, and we say that this does not work at all, right? Uh, and, uh, but there are times where let's say we do, we find a six, 60, 40, split, 62% of the time they fail, 40% of the time they're successful. Now those 40% of the time that are successful, what are some of the outliers within that group when it is working? Is there something there? You want to go in and dig a little deeper, right? Uh, and, and go and analyze. So based on performance and definition criteria, then you could start to specialize and say, hey, these are working when this happens. This is work. This is not working when this happens. So those outliers, so failures will tell you a lot about uh, this because they're outlier. They, they will have a common theme among them. Success stocks will have a common theme and it's your job to now identify those common threads and then build and say, it's very important as part of the study, even if you come up with a conclusion that this works, you need to know when it doesn't work, right? And if you don't know when your edge is not working, that's really the name of the game at the end of the day. When your setup is not working, when your edge is not present, 
you need to stay away and you need to analyze that part of it as well. Not just when it, it you know, people get confused that this setup will work in every market. There's no such thing. Every setup has a market type associated with it. And you did this analysis right here, this outlier analysis on when is it working, when is it not working, will tell you that. Um, Richard, you could go ahead with, you know, share your thoughts. No, uh, I, I think, I think you pretty much said it. Um, you know, when it comes to drawing conclusions, again, you, you want to be as intellectually honest as possible and try to be very objective and if you gave a trader of the same ability uh, the same set of examples, they should come up with those same conclusions. So don't try to don't try to force something that isn't there. Um, look look for the truth and look for ways that your examples can help you perform. Um, and again, yeah, analyzing stuff by group by subgroup that you that you um, that you found that's that's super helpful as well. And with outlier stocks, you know. How do you find an outlier stock? Basically, you know, on the def on the performance criteria side of things, they could be way to the right on the performance scale. They could have moved two hundred percent in three months when the average moved twenty percent. Or on the definition side of things, their gap up could be one hundred fifty percent versus the normal one is ten twenty percent. And you might find that those stocks with those type of outliers don't work because maybe it's just an acquisition or, you know, a biotech gapping up um, and doesn't move at that. So it just because they're outliers doesn't mean they have to be good outliers. They can be bad outliers too. You, you want to kind of be uh, agnostic to, to, to that is a good point. One, one example that comes to mind was when uh, the, when I was looking at the gold market and the uh, oil market and trying to figure that stuff out a while ago as to how like currency plays a role and how gold really tries to move. And one of the outliers in that was basically um, when the commitment of traders report shows that large com you know, commercial hedgers tend to be positive. This was an observation that someone made and, and then I we don't went back and did the study and all of that stuff um, to, to, to look at it. Does it really happen? That was an outlier in terms of this is how gold makes big, big moves. Right. Um, so that stood out. And that's the only way I will, I trade gold today was this special condition. This very specific scenario needs to happen because it's the only way I could figure out a way to trade gold and, um, you know, even buy, uh, you know, ounces of gold or whatever the case might be. So you will find that in whatever study that you do, you will find that, you know, that it, it will, it usually becomes very obvious that this works in this type. And then you can move on with, you know, summarize your findings and uh, maybe you have different ideas based on what you studied and what you found. So I'll, I'll, I'll take this. So once you've drawn conclusions, you can come up, kind of come up with your ideal blueprint for that edge or for that setup. Uh, think about what definition criteria had the biggest impact on performance. Uh, what would the ideal setup be in your mind? And then you can come up with screens or processes, routines, whatever, to look for that in the future when, you know, the market is right for that type of setup. So uh, we'll touch on this in a bit, but I, I do really want to emphasize that the market and, and the group can have a huge impact on the success of a setup in that moment in time. So that's almost the, the most important definition criteria to track. You know, you'll find that a lot of the same setup works together in a, a particular period because, you know, that's what the risk appetite is. Um, so remember that the overall market and how it's doing will have a, a, an extreme impact in real time in the future. So don't just take your ideal setup and try to trade it all the time. Think about when it works best uh, based on based on your historical study. So that's especially key, key technical that trading, good. right? Like especially technical trading, this really applies to the technical may not apply to fundamental because fundamental, you know, they're looking at quarters, uh, years of data. So then your hypo your conclusions are in three years from now, we'll see price appreciation of this stock to be this. But technically, it's very important um, to to have that in terms of screens and processes and blueprints. So yep. yes, this discussion is being recorded.
Yeah. So, and, and just, I made this slide because just because it's so important, yeah. remember the market impact, um, the market environment is likely the most important definition criteria will likely have the greatest effect on performance. Uh, think about what the market looked like in the most successful examples. Um, you could then build a study on what the market looked like almost it's, it's a little fractal there. Um, in these periods where the groups of similar setups all working, consider all that in your conclusions um, and don't let, you know, uh, think of that because if you don't consider that, you might draw the wrong conclusions that doesn't work in real time, I guess. You might you might think, you know, this is the most in criteria, this works all the time, but really in reality, it was because it was a 2020 market or it was a 90s market or it was a bear market if you're doing a short study on something like that. So um, it's really important to remember the market impact and take that into account in real time when you're coming up with examples, as well as when you're analyzing uh, your conclusions. And also some of the macro stuff that you see people throw around, right? Inflation, this this seems to happen in terms of price action when we see infl you know, inflation or recessions uh, tend to cause this type of movement in the markets. So a lot of this um, tends to boil down to the, the biggest factor, and this is the biggest factor. Like you have to, in my opinion, account for these things for you to um, successfully steer. There's no such thing as I'll find a technical pattern that works all the time. It's just very hard um, to to do that. And market plays a big role. You just can't ignore uh, the market. Some people say, hey, uh, number of setups, if I have X number of setups, only then I'll trade. That's again, looking at market environment at the end of the day. It's just a different way of saying the same thing. So sorry about that. Yeah, bless so you. test in real life. So next step to this is like you've collected it, you've documented it, you've done all your homework, um, you you know the data points, but application going out, you know, uh, adjusting your routines, right? If you want to incorporate, like I'm trying to incorporate RMV into my stuff, it's going to take me a little bit of time. It's not something I just pick because Richard, uh, you know, came up with it. And now it's the, the only thing I do. It's very hard for me to do that at the end of the day. So what I tend to do in the, in the approach I take is I will allocate, um, some people do it through, um, these, uh, you know, test accounts, or I, I don't know what they call them, but, uh, where you're, you're paper trading, there you go. Paper trading. I think that's, it's a load of bullshit. Like it doesn't give you that real feel. So what I tend to do is I allocate percentage of my capital and I'll try these things out on that capital and I'm willing to lose all of it. If that, if that's the case, that could be 5%, 10%, whatever the case might be, but it allows me to have some real emotion uh, behind it because it's my real money at, you know, and then I could get the most real feedback from that uh, paper accounts can work, but it doesn't give, in my opinion, it doesn't it doesn't give you. There will be people that disagree with me, and that's perfectly fine. But that's what's worked best for me is to when I go test in real life, put some real money on the line and see some, you know, real feedback and really adjust to that over um, a spend time. So, conclusions, hypotheses, whatever you make up to this point, if you can't apply them and have the same emotional state or some balance in your emotional state, that means it's still not an edge for you it sounds pretty kind of sad but it's the reality of how things work like execution is very emotional and risk management is is very like has to be done in real life for you to really learn the the, the bad the good bad and the ugly of it and that's what this step is about i think you know put allocate five ten percent whatever you think or are you comfortable with losing in, at the end of the day uh to this and then really test your conclusions that you've made uh in the previous slide that we don't talked about so richard i'm curious to know how you go about it and how you do it uh if any different yeah so, i i allocate a, a portion of my account just like you typically about five percent um for me it's it's often so far just kind of tweaks to existing processes so sometimes i just kind of think about the study that i've done and apply the results it's kind of my normal trading almost, um, you know, trying out a new entry tactic uh, in, in association with the setup that I've already been using, that type of thing. 
Uh, and then I write notes on how those trades do and, and you know, think about it in real time how it's doing. So this is an example. This is VRT, uh, the gap up from previously this year. I traded this. Um, I sold it too early, but no, the, the next one actually was the one I traded. Yep. So this one, uh, you know, the volume is huge. So um, I've learned kind of the the HVE and, and the gap up methodology from Rye, and I've kind of incorporated that into my system. And there's definitely periods where this is almost the only trade that I'll take because it's just working so effectively. And uh, especially May what, this year, like May yeah. this year, the amount that we saw at the same time coming through like this area, like this May, we saw so many stocks doing the same thing. And then yeah. all of those have rallied 80 you know, 40, 50, 60 percent. Uh, yeah. And you could name if you could name five or more at the top of your head, then that was the environment. Yeah. And again, I just want to reemphasize, remember the market impact, especially in real time, that's going to have a big impact. Um, so don't do a whole study, come up with an edge. And then when you try it in real life in an environment that's not suited for, throw it out the window because it's not working. Um, always think about What's the proper environment to employ this edge, this setup, this entry tactic, all of that? All right. So iterate. So this one's uh, another important one. It's it, it will never be perfect, but you can add bits and pieces to it, right? So when I say that uh, for earning gap ups, even though the closing range is low, but there's an expectation breaker that happens where you expect the price to go down and fade and break the low of the earnings gap. For example, I'm just, you know, something like CLS and VRT um, did both of those things. Then that's something you get through iteration into your process, right? And you refine and improve this uh, study that you've done and add bits and pieces as you go out in real life, apply it make new observations, right? New hypothesis, hypotheses, come back, go through step one to seven again, right? And then what one, you will improve your edge. Second, you have, what you've done is what we're saying. You're iterating, right? You're iterating uh, by making new observations and continuously improving uh, based on this framework. And the one before this, which is important, like you go out in real life, make a new observation. That's the key part as well. That could be one way to do it. Another way is you make an observation. Uh, as you go through this study, you make a new observation. You can then iterate on the fly as well. So there's really two ways to go about it. Real life application will give you ways to iterate, or while you do the study, you will find, hey, I should include this because I'm noticing this among the 250 examples that I've collected as well. Any other ways, Richard, that you see like on, on how you find ways to iterate, you know, and go back to step one on the same kind of study that you're doing? Uh, I, I don't think I have like a formal process, but I'm just mm -hmm. always thinking of ways to improve it, right? Uh, based on a, a lot of times, you know, new trades or new ideas that I, I find, I'll notice an additional characteristic or something that then I can go back and test either on the same examples or on new examples. So it, it's more of a uh, frame of mind, just like being curious is, you know, I, I'm using this setup. What's something that I've learned recently that can help me use it in the future? You know, that that kind of uh, mentality. Perfect. So the next step of this webinar is kind of building a model book and we'll, I, we'll be posting a link or something. Um, yeah, yeah, I'll, uh, that's later on. But yeah, we'll include in this section on on building model books. Uh, some really great resources for you, both the 2020 model book as well as the 2021 uh, ones that that we've created that break down the greatest winning stocks, both on a fundamental and technical basis and plot out their moves, all of that. So really great resources. And, and we'll share that in just a minute. Perfect. So a model book is basically a collection of stocks that have uh, you can build a model book on the long side, the short side, a mix of both. Uh, it could be a yearly exercise or a homework that you do for yourself, right? And then you analyze the market as a whole. So uh, we, you know, we at TraderLine make one um, market, like a IBD makes a great one on an annual basis. Um, a lot of, I'm not sure of other bigger resources, but it's just a good exercise for you to go through. It's almost like a yearly homework 
that you know uh, assignment that you could do for yourself because that is going to improve your game or you know improve move you closer to being a professional in this space so each stock can be analyzed on a set of fundamental and technical criteria that you define and that align with your trading it could it's your model book you it's it's a model book based on your trading style is what you could think of as well hey i saw success in my trading style this year. So if Ross is making one, he tends to look at uh, theme, market, groups first and uh, string together which stocks move the best in those. And then technically he will rank them based on performance and then study those in depth. Where could I have, where could I have entered you know, these stocks based on my entry tactics? Did my edge show on the charts? And he's going back, even if he missed it, what he's doing is he's going back because that he's visualizing that evidence, confirming that what he sees and tracks on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis is still working in the markets on a yearly basis. And it at the end of the day, it gives him the biggest confidence that while going into next year that, hey, uh, what I'm doing is still pretty much in line with how the market is trading. So, and it creates a valid, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like a summary for the year for your own trading style is how I would think of it uh, is a model book. So there's no one right way as long as you go through this assignment and do it for yourself. So uh, Richard, anything? No, nothing more to add. Um, I, I, you know, a very common thing is to make a model book on a year, but I, I think you can almost couple it with the study and come up with a model book on a pattern, right? If you want to make a VCP, model book you could if you want to make a gap up model book you can uh take into account different time periods all of that so it's up to you it's a resource for you at the end of the day a really valuable one so uh make what you want and and kind of the two goals of a model book is again you know build that resource for yourself build a reference of historical precedence that you can use to uh, refer back to when you're studying current examples um and just just like doing a study while you're building a model book you'll be incorporating and learning so much about a setup about different stocks about winning characteristics and the overall behavior of top performing stocks how they move how they act how they break out how they top how they decline all of that uh that will be invaluable later on in your trading uh you'll you'll be able to directly apply all this knowledge uh in real time so uh you know just you know the journey itself building the model book is such a helpful process that will teach you so much about about winning stocks and how to trade them. So two goals to build a reference, right? Historical precedent. A lot of traders you'll see um, that that make uh, forward looking conclusions of what the market is going to do is based on historical precedents that they see in situations that they've experienced. They could be mental model books at the end of the day or experiences in the market and uh, which can be referred back to when applied. And then you gain insight on your trading system. It improves your, you know, hey, I look at this and I'm always, uh, you know, entering these things late is something that I see a lot of traders say and and, uh, generalize and, you know, they say it very easily, but they do nothing about it. Well, building a model book or going through a study is a way to to get away from those late entries and maybe move them back uh, to where you think you should be entering, right? So these give you insight about the characteristics and the behaviors of not only top performing stocks, but top performing stocks that are aligned with your trading style at the end of the day. So key steps to building a model book, determine the scope, Build a wide list, finalize to a smaller list, research fundamental drivers, annotate, and build, put it all together. So this is, you know, some steps that you could go through. Uh, scope I can be defined as almost, you know, what aligns with your trading system is your scope. So what are the edges that you have? What are the entry tactics that you deploy? And were those edges and entry tactics available and on offer, you know, throughout the year? whether you traded them or you missed them can be included in your model book. Second, you know, a list is always defined. Hey, uh, X amount of stocks. If I do a gap up model book, for example, on a yearly basis, because that's kind of most of my tradings based on that, uh, then I have a wider list. You know, I can have 150 
uh, 200, but obviously I want to kind of define them into, okay, I'll study uh, or I'll build a model book based on, you know, instant movement uh, failures as well. And then ones that in a good market also failed could be just, you know, a, a hypothesis, you know, some, some way to, to go about it, to, to build a smaller list from that wide list. Um, so let's keep going. So determine the scope, Richard. Yeah, I'll take this. Yeah. So, um, it depends again, if you want to focus on a particular year or a particular market cycle versus studying a setup, you know, choose which type of model book you want to make. Uh, then, you know, in general, how many stocks do you want to incorporate into the model book? Uh, we'll talk about going from the wide list to the final list and, and basically how restrictive you want to be determines this number of stocks. Then, you know, depending on your style, this is what you want to ask yourself. Do I, do I want to focus more about the fundamentals in this model book? Do I want to focus more on the technicals or do I want to incorporate the hybrid of, of both? So just like creating a, creating a study, be very, be very specific about the scope. So you actually get it done and, you know, complete the project. Cause at the end of the day, that that's, what's really important. And make sure that lot, it's in line with your trading. I think is most important. You don't want to come out and like turn a model book into a study. There's two very different things again. Uh, a study is you seeing if this technical criteria or this fundamental criteria is in line with the observation you make. A model book is, I know the fundamentals and technicals I trade with, right? And I'm building kind of a yearly review or report what I'm doing. So the one is the proven part of your system. Other is you're trying to make them part of your system. So uh, building a white list. So cast a wide net, uh, it could be through screening, could be through, you know, chat GPT um, should be included here as well. It's a great resource um, to, to kind of just, you know, you could type in pretty much anything and it will give you some level of accurate information. Um, so Google obviously, and then consider leading themes. I think um, a wide list based on market cycle is also something to look at as well because everything at the end of the day it all ties down to how the market's acting uh there are leaders throughout the year usually there's there's you know what people call poster child like nvidia that will move out move up and out throughout the year or those smaller elf uh type of moves uh that happen or anf this year right uh, those ones you want to take a look at too uh, but usually it boils down to the the biggest theme in the market and how was the market cycle that year? Because uh, building a long side model book in a corrective market like 2022 was is tough. It's it's you're just you're forcing the issue just for the sake of forcing the issue. The only thing I gathered, let's say from 2022, was that in these type of markets, the uh, energy names will uh, be performing really well, right? So you could have built a model book if if you were bullish. A bullish model book in 2022 would make that type of conclusion um, at the end of the day. So, oh wait, go back for a second. So uh, yeah. I here I just show us. You know, we're actually in the process right now of very of starting the plan for this year's model book, uh, and this is a screen that I made to to work with Ross to to come up with a, our wide list. So it's basically looking at the percent change the past 200 days. Um, is that over 50% or not? That's kind of a, a bare minimum criteria almost. And then there's also a, a very simple liquidity threshold of 20 million. And that, they, that came up with a list of, I think, 116 stocks or something. And and that's a good starting point, right? We're, lo we're looking for stocks that performed uh, and have, you know, they're not just um, penny stocks. But, you know, if you trade penny stocks, you want to get rid of that liquidity cri criteria, right? So you want to think about what makes sense to you and your process, all of that. Um, and this came up with a list of a lot of the names that all of us have been trading uh, that are great candidates. You know, CEIX is on there, ELF's on there, uh, CrowdStrike's on there. Um, so this is a, a great screen to use. And obviously you could change that 200 days to 250 days at the end of the year uh, to come up with, you know, the list of year to date, or we also have year to date criteria as well. So. Uh, that's another good good way to get a good list to start with. So 
Finalizing a smaller list, again, trading style, I think, is the biggest one here. Uh, mm -hmm. Things have to align. And um, theme, I think. Yeah. Trading style theme, and theme. For sure. Usually, you'll see, like, uh, every year, there's some sort of theme in the markets. Like, 2022 energy was a theme, right? Um, and this year, it's more uh, the traditional growth, I think, has worked really well for parts of it. Uh, just don't look at the FFTY. Well, um, semi semis is a theme sem this yeah. year. Or AI is kind of the larger some themes. of the yeah. like software esque related yeah. AI. So AI, if if we were to pick one, it's AI, right? Um, this year, where uh, the move in the the symbol AI was huge uh, as well, and that could be something you look at. It. You know, I know when I when I uh, studied some, you know, shippers back in 2015 were the best trade, even though they trade, they were no, they were not canceling characteristics. They were not, they were nothing to do with anything in terms of, uh, but there were massive moves, 300, 400, 500% in a very short span of time. And that became uh, one of the, the ways I became curious about seems to be, every, you know, there seems to be something every year the market picks on and then it backs that. So Cannabis was a big thing where we saw a whole bunch of cannabis stocks just go like uh, TLRY, Beyond Meat, right? So that was uh, in a certain span of time, that became the huge thing. This year was the stock AI, but how who implemented it better? Adobe, NVIDIA, Microsoft, those names uh, became ba you know basketed under the AI theme. So stocks closest to this is important as well but as you cast your wide list you will see certain themes but you will also become curious about hey these stocks may not meet the my criteria they might not be my trading style and i think that's a good thing because the wide list will tell you maybe you can develop another edge or another way of trading in the markets that's not currently in your trade then you get study ideas and then you go study do that and then that whole process repeats um itself so I think we're good here. Um, research fundamental drivers, Richard. Yeah, so I'll take this. So uh, this is if you want to consider this, right? So this is an example on the right-hand side of what Ross dives into. Uh, this is for Etsy back in the 2020 model book. And I put the links in the chat uh, previously. And if you're watching on YouTube, they'll be in the description as well as um, – uh, popping up the, the links will be popping up right now uh, but basically you can look into the summary of the business model description of the company what do they do what are what is their leading product service what have what have you uh what were, was their group or sector again that's so key and that drives a lot of their performance as we've said mul multiple times um what was the theme that they were a part of that's really important as we mentioned um, what key product server, service announcements, announcements did they have that year that contributed to their fundamental, you know, performance? Uh, what was their EPS sales growth? Did they have surprises? What's the end factor that describes them? Th those are all some things that you consider when it comes to the fundamentals. Yep. And then annotating the charts, uh, you know, analyze the price. What? Go ahead. I, I love doing this. Yeah, yeah, this is it's, it's therapeutic. Oh, it's it's fun. <laughs> uh, yeah, analyze the price chart of the move. Uh, be as detailed as is helpful to you. You know, some people like to keep it simple. Other people like to analyze every single uh, characteristic. Um, you know, I I say do it for yourself. What helps you? Um, you know, some people who are more experienced can take a more high level view because they just see those expectation breakers so clearly while a newer trader might want to practice getting a little bit more detailed. It's kind of up to you in your process. Uh, label, potential entry, exit points. Again, being intellectually honest is important here. Uh, it's no good to say I'm going to buy the bottom off the 200-day moving average and hold it the entire way because I'm amazing and that's just what I do. Uh, be honest. When would it come on your radar? That's something to consider. You know, Where in your routines would you find this stock? You know, maybe it had a gap up and that's how it got on your radar. Maybe it crossed about the 50 days, so it'd show up on your screens. Um, but also, when would you likely exit and did it continue from that point or did it fail from that point? Um, there's a lot of nasty reversals in every chart of the greatest winners that likely scared a lot of people out. Um, so be honest there and uh, think about, you know, where you would exit 
and uh, you can always go back to your rules and, and kind of adjust them based based on these studies. So edges, set up entry tactics. Uh, I mentioned already where would have gone on your radar, why, and again, consider the market. You know, was it outperforming when the market was pulling back? Uh, was it showing relative strength new highs before price? Um, yeah, any anything that's relevant to you and your process, uh, that's what you should include on the charts and at the granularity that that you want. Anything to add, Roy? Anything also, you'd like to do? Yeah, tying it back to process and also kind of rehearsing uh, in your head as to, hey, uh, when I do my daily routine at this point, I should have had this on my X watch list, right? That's how I, that's how I tend to do it because it gives me confidence. Okay, if I run my scans, I do my daily routine, I do my weekend routine. This should have been on my radar. If it wasn't while you build that model bug and it was completely off radar, you need to go back and look at your process and improve those. It could be a missed criteria uh, or you need to loosen up your, sc uh, your screens a little bit because you see enough evidence that this name should have been on your radar. And then you adjust your routines as well a little bit, not drastically, not just you know throw everything you have out the door and come up with something new, but tweak improve iterate based on what so what i tend to like if i were to go through this a uh there's a high volume gap at this point it 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 would have been on my hv watch list this then breaks it down right at this point i would have removed it from my hv watch list at what point does it get back and when does it get back right or i run a new highs list and i would have seen it over here so you're you're rehearsing as you build this with your head that comes out, we, we spoke about this in the routines webinar, the edges webinar, they, all these things are so connected. You can't really ignore one or the other, but while, while you're doing this, you're re meant, just mentally rehearse uh, where in your process these things fit. So it gives you the slightest chance, you know, um, at least it gives you a chance to succeed at the end of the day, but it doesn't obviously guarantee success because that uh, boils down to actually doing the studies, coming up with a system process, all of those things, talking to each other, so... Um, putting it all together. Yeah. I think a lot, you know, you could build, we build a model book. Uh, we find the exercise to be fun. Uh, we see and visualize the market. That's why we do it. And then we publish it. It's good to, to go out and see what we're doing, but the purpose of this is you have, you know, you should be building your own as well. We're publishing based on our trading style, what we see, and that's all fine and good. Uh, but at the end of the day, if you want to be, you know, those successful traders that we mentioned at the very start of this webinar, then you need to do the exercise uh, for yourself. So combine stocks into one resource. You could have like a OneNote, I think is very effective. You could use Word, Google Docs, Canva, but OneNote is a free tool um, that you could just create, you know, a, a notebook in that, and then you dedicate it to a model book, and then you could just paste in a lot of stuff. Very effective tool. Uh, for that. Canva is more like a visualization tool. Not a lot of people will use it, but our goal with deep views as well to create some sort of system where you can snipe uh, charts very quickly and build model books very quickly. And a lot of the framework that we spoke about, how do we incorporate that into the software so that it's very trading oriented. OneNote, Google Docs, Canva, all these things are fine, but they're not catered towards trading and investing. So one of our goals is to make that happen within deep view where it, it, it almost will uh, feel l less of a friction or a barrier of entry or more motivational even at the end of the day to do a study, right, um, as well. So fundamental and technical pages, key takeaways. Uh, we'll post a link to this model book. You'll see the frame, you know, how we structured it for yourself. So discussion of the overall model book theme. So we tend to put some tickers so that, you know, looking back at 20, you know, let's say we're in 2030, uh, we'll know some of, you know, you could visually see this stuff and it's kind of, you know, good on the eye uh, when you go back and look at it in a couple of years. Hey, I remember this stock doing this. I remember that stock doing that. So, yeah, I just posted the link to that one again. And going back uh, just for one sec. Uh, yeah, I'm really excited for when we incorporate that into the Notion too, so. Yeah, Notion's an option too. But with Deep View, I, you know, we've had ideas where the charts will almost be live. So you're able to click on that chart and it brings you right to that uh, so you can study it more. So uh, we're going to be coming up with a lot of cool ideas in Deep View to, to improve this process and make it more effective as a resource. So 
Um, and maybe they'll be able to share it on the platform as well with other people. I think that'd be awesome. Great. So just some advice uh, for building model books. Every trader who wants to improve should build them. Start simple, like we said. Uh, the 2020-2021 market cycle is a great place to, to start. You could do it for yourself and then compare it to ours. See, see you know, what you can improve. Uh, then, you know, build a database, a playbook of your favorite setup. Make one on that. Uh, and then study other model books for ideas. Like we said, we, we've got links to ours down below for free. Um, there's also some other great ones. John Boyk, a lot of his books are essentially model books, especially the recent one. Uh, so, and in the first 100 pages of how to make money in stocks, that is Bill O'Neill's model book. So those are all great resources for you to try to see how other great traders have done it. And then you can incorporate that into your own process. Perfect. So the link is in the description. If you're watching on YouTube, it will be also in the description. Uh, if you're on Zoom right now, you know, it's in the Zoom chat. So that's all we had for today. Recommended tool for uh, that we're developing is DeepView. Obviously, we're going to incorporate a lot of these concepts into DeepView when it gets to the journaling module and and how to build model model books. Uh, so as traders, we're you know we're building this platform uh, you know day to day. And uh, a lot of what we speak about, we want to, you know, see it in reality in a couple of quarters here uh, with deep view. So download the ultimate guide. Thank you for attending. Um, waiting on the Oliver announcement. <laughs> um, yeah, it, you, you'll hear about it in a couple of days. I think it's fine to say here is fine a number of people. So uh, TL is partnering with uh, Oliver Kell. Uh, we're going to come out with a service called the Swing Report. Uh, it's going to be Oliver's newsletter service uh, twice a week. You will get, you know, a mid week update, uh, end of uh, a weekend update. And there's a whole bunch, you know, a Q and a webinar a month, et cetera. So uh, we've been working on this for a couple of months now. And as most of you private access people know um, uh, already, and it will be public in a few days. And by the time it's on YouTube, Richard, it'll be a week from now. So it's fine. Um, so you can go to the swingreport.com, the swingreport.com to opt in. Uh, and there's a wait list. Uh, and we've partnered up with Oliver Kell to bring, he's the 2020 US investing champion and also the record holder in that contest with 941% gain. And uh, we're bringing, you know, uh, we're partnering with him to to give, uh, you know, have a newsletter service where he's going to be writing the newsletter. So amazing. Uh, kudos to the team for making that happen. Um, if if you're private access folks, yeah, you could go and it doesn't really matter. You could go and opt in. It's fine. We'll, we'll do the, the stuff in the background there to uh, segment everybody out. So that's all we had for today. Uh, the next webinar, Richard, is going to be next Saturday, same time, right? Same place. Um, if you're watching this on YouTube, there should be a whole playlist uh, that kind of shows up or you could search up the previous webinars. I think it's a huge you know, resource that we're building uh, here. And then next week will be framework nine, correct? Journaling, yeah. Journaling, and we'll get into the depths of that. We might even have Nick on to talk a little bit about psychology, um, if I can convince him. And then, yeah, so that'll be great as well. So we'll cover those two aspects next week so that's all i had yeah perfect thank you guys all for attending i uh, really appreciate you guys checking this out and, and hopefully you find it helpful um if you're watching this on youtube and did did find it valuable please go ahead uh leave a like down below subscribe to the channel uh share it with your trading friends anybody who you think uh you know would find it useful and just you know a, a quick thing about the ultimate trading guide 100 free and and we spent a few months putting this together 115 pages of really, th there's no fluff in that 115 pages. It's examples, edges, entry tactics, everything that, you know, we've walked through in these webinars, but almost, um, you know, more in depth, uh, getting into more examples, all of that. So highly recommend checking that out if you haven't. Uh, again, the link is down below in the description if you're watching this on YouTube. Uh, but with that, thanks so much for tuning in, everybody. Um, and we'll see you guys in the next one. Cheers. Have a good weekend.